Hello everyone and welcome on Aki Diaries for the second live interview of this month under our live interview series which is titled as Reflections on Architecture and Design. In this interview series we call guests from various disciplines related to the field of architecture and design and try to get their views and generate a discussion out of that thing. I'm really glad to share that for our second interview of this month, today we have with us an urban conservationist and founder of Heritage Synergies India, Kamalika Boz. Kamalika, welcome on Aki Diaries. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining with us. So before I hand it over to Kamalika for her uh, presentation, please allow me to introduce her. Kamalika Boz is an urban conservationist and founder of Heritage Synergies India a Mumbai-based consultancy bridging practice, research, and education. Her work lies at the intersection of built and cultural heritage, museum design and curation, writing and teaching. Kamalika has worked on community-oriented urban conservation and adaptive reuse initiatives in historic Indian cities, namely Kolkata's Chitpur Road and Chinatown, Mumbai's Warli Kolewada and Naval Dockyard, Pune's cantonment area and Azim Ganj in Murshidabad. She is also a curatorial and design consultant for museum and cultural heritage projects, working on new museums and exhibitions in India. She has authored five books, including People Called Kolkata and The Hoysala Legacy Belur Halibitu Somanath Pura. Kamalika is an expert member of the ICOMOS India and she has also been a visiting faculty at Anant National University Ahmedabad, Oro University Surat and KRVIA Mumbai. Uh, Kamalika uh, has chosen the title of today's talk as Practice as Catalyst, Heritage, Communities and Design. Kamalika, this sounds for a very interesting presentation and uh, over to you for your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share the work that I've been doing uh, for the last few years and uh, being able to share it with uh, the wide audience base that you have as well. Should I uh, start and share my screen? Yeah, please. Okay. Is this visible? Yes, perfect. So good morning everyone. I have uh, titled my uh, talk practice as a catalyst because these are the three sort of areas that I largely work in in the context of heritage which is with uh, communities and then how you engage design uh, both uh, historic as well as new design within this context. Uh, to give a sort of preamble and a, a brief overview of where my concerns stem from which direct and guide uh, the work and, that I have been doing lately. Uh, so I was always sort of this cognizant of when we look at our cities, when, I, when we look at our built environments, this sort of a great divide that we see between the, the monumental landmarks and every city has them. So it's not only about the Taj Mahal, every city has protected and celebrated landmarks, which seem to uh, get the attention, which seem to get uh, funding as well as sort of recognition uh, to, to want to be preserved. But there's also the everyday heritage, which is unprotected, which is unloved, which is kind of falling apart every day in front of our eyes. And that's where we're kind of struggling to keep the fabric intact and not just some uh, pickled and uh, isolated uh, monuments. So that's where really my interest started uh, stemming when I entered this world of uh, conservation, which is what do we really do about uh, the unprotected and unloved everyday heritage that surrounds us. And in the course, um, I realized that uh, there are kind of these broad five common faiths, as I um, as I uh, cluster them as, of India's built unprotected heritage. Uh, the first is, of course, what we see happening around us is outright demolition, where unlisted or privately owned uh, uh, buildings, due to the lack of uh, mechanisms to save them or make them viable, uh, are daily being demolished uh, in front of our eyes. 
The second is really demolition by neglect, where we wait to wait for a building to collapse by not taking care of it, by not maintaining it or re repairing it, or you know. And again, these are, are then succumb to natural or man-made hazards such as fire or an extreme monsoon or a balcony collapses, etc. The third is, of course, incongruent change, where you can't pull a building down, but you also don't have maybe the funds or the vision to repair it. And then, but you want to modernize it in some way. So this is the kind of, you know, the skin that you put over half of it, and you develop this sort of bipolar like attitude towards the old and the new. And we get a very packed patchwork city in uh, the process. Then, of course, uh, the fourth is where heritage over time begins to mutate. And you see a historic building, which may have been very beautiful at one point in time, is sort of developing various uh, uh, new uh, tentacles all around it because it's understated, it's tenanted, people sort of uh, uh, grow and develop, grow it in whatever way they feel like without any regulation. And eventually, when we have many, many, many such buildings in our built environment, in our everyday environments, we begin to see that there is a loss of surrounding character. And if we only focus on the monuments, then the, the fabric around becomes irreversibly uh, changed, as uh, we see in several, several Indian cities, due to, again, the same reasons of lack of regulation protection and incentives. So much so that as we move towards um, the development in the future and what we know as the I understand as the uh, markers of progress and development, we actually find that the heritage itself becomes the orphan. It become it look it stands out like a sore thumb um, and it almost feels like it doesn't belong there and it should be pulled down. So my concern really here has been that how do we effectively engage with local actors to save our historic assets and cultural resources while managing the change because you cannot avoid the change you cannot freeze the time and you cannot negate the uh, fact of the times that we live in and the pressures that they um, entail so from there I, I when i started developing uh, my practice uh, in officially and formally only since 2017 but uh, before that about it so it's been a sort of a decade long engagement where i've worked initially as an independent uh, freelance uh, consultant and then formalized it only in the last 5 or 6 years the idea was how do i uh, use uh, this this practice as a catalyst as an agent of change and can i really bring about an impact of some sort and here i think i was um the, rahul merotra talks about this very uh, uh, very well in as what is our sphere of concern so what are the things that really concern us and what is our sphere of influence like can we actually do do we have the agency to do something about it and how much can we actually do so where both of these interject is somewhere that i wanted to situate situate uh, my work and my practice uh, and the way to do it I thought was by intersecting uh, the idea of heritage the idea of who actually owns lives and and uh, whose inheritance is this uh, who are the community so working with communities and how do you uh, bring in the element of design which has been my front fundamental sort of education and training and of course uh, these are not separate buckets they within the realm of my practice they uh, intersect, intermesh, and that is why the synergies, because they have to be in synergy with each other to really uh, bring, bring an impact. And, and within each of these, um, of course, there are, again, they're not clear verticals, but looking at heritage in the larger context of urban, urban conservation and local area planning, and how does that then dovetail with research and education to impact and work with communities that celebrate India's plurality and multiculturalism. And to do this, of course, there needs to be an engagement and participation with communities and other actors so that it's not only a top-down process, but there's a bottom-up uh, 
bottom up process as well which many times drives things more successfully than when it is top down and to do that advocacy and heritage activism becomes an inherent part of uh, when you work with heritage and communities and then of course there's the aspect of uh, design which is uh, which is through adapting these spaces into stories that you tell through cultural heritage through curating these uh, narratives in uh, sometimes in the exhibition and museum space so when all of this sort of comes together the the focus to sort of define my role and define my work is to broadly look at forgotten spaces untold stories that sort of look at the diversity of india the communities many of them are ethnic minorities they are marginalized or they have lost their voice over time and agency over time so how do you sort of bring all of this together which is really the big challenge uh, and often times you meet successes often times you meet failures and that is really the learning so looking therefore at the large a uh, broad canvas of uh, the uh, the work that i've been doing for the last uh, 10 years um it again it it uh, straddles between each of these aspects and i'm going to look um, talk about some of them um but also these are like i said they are not silos and compartments and each one informs the other uh, be it and uh, you know when i'm engaging with teaching and academia or when i'm working with communities or the government or when i'm working with uh, museum consultants or you know as a consultant uh, heritage architect to an architectural firm so uh, i'm going to start with uh, some some approaches towards um, and these were very the, the the initial work that i did once i came back from uh, my US, uh, from my masters program um, in the us in 20 uh, in 2013 so uh the was really to look at the bengal landscape itself and look at the bengal landscape outside of calcutta which is the city i was born and raised in but uh looking to identify uh, unlike kind of places like rajasthan and kerala and even gujarat to a certain extent which have been able to capitalize and tap into uh, their heritage through a cultural tourism and a cultural economy uh, bengal at that point and even now is largely has struggled with that though it's made some headway in the last 5 to 7 years so in this uh, in the former capital of bengal which is um, uh, murshidabad before the capital shifted to kolkata we have this communities of jains that had migrated from uh, bikaner and you have the jain patti in the twin towns of azim ganj and jia ganj and this is where uh, uh, engaging with a citizen organization group called the murshidabad heritage development society and this is the time i was just i had just sort of moved out of full time teaching accept but through a winter co a winter school uh, module i was um, able to take the students here to azim ganj to again a sort of forgotten part of uh, bengal that had totally fallen off the map and fallen off the grid and it was a ghost town when we went there to just start sort of documenting the rich uh, cultural assets that the community held but had moved to kolkata and uh, you know this was again a forgotten sort of uh, space and they were also grappling with what to do with uh, this rich town uh so it's also a very important uh, pilgrimage place for the for the jains there are 15 historic jain temples within a sort of 2 um, square kilometer uh, radius uh, and uh, with a eclectic style of architecture as you can see it does not really conform to any of the other uh, typical styles of jain temples that we know because it grew from a sort of regional uh, uh, context along with the large kothis and havelis which are now largely taken care of by caretakers because the families live in kolkata so the idea was that how do you a first document these places and as you can see through hand drawn really really engaging on site with with uh, the students uh, we were able to then have stakeholder engagement with the community members to to plan out over the next uh, Two, uh, two and a half years. A series of um, mobilizing um, 
engagements such as traveling exhibitions, um, international seminars, uh, which really uh, propelled the community to think about uh, how do you look at your own heritage as an asset and not as a white elephant or as a liability. And we were able to get uh, multiple sort of experts and uh, uh, people working in the field to come to Murshidabad and and to, to, to build this sort of consciousness and awareness. And uh, over time, what that did, it did mobilize uh, some of the families. And uh, this was the transformation that happened in a year where one of the families decided to uh, plow in their own uh, fi uh, finances to convert their large poti, large haveli into a heritage homestay. And uh, through renewed and sustained efforts that today, uh, it opened three years back, but it today is is uh, the first sort of uh, restored uh, heritage hotel in the context at, at, at a large scale in the context of uh, of this region. So what the effort really was for uh, for me was to create an ecosystem where it's not just one Haveli or one isolated effort, but an ecosystem of heritage led economic drivers that build on local act actions through the temples, through the residences and through the community and engagement, but is able to have a ripple effect and have regional impacts uh, for other sites in the region and, la and then dovetail into uh, a, a sort of holistic uh, cultural tourism uh, led uh, revitalization of the area. But this that that was an example of where you know you have some sort of a client and you know uh, the, and a direction that you can work on, which is tangible. Uh, this is another example of uh, something that I've been working on again for the last uh, five years in a concerted way, but it started with my undergrad thesis at SEPT, uh, uh, but it's kind of stayed on with me. And now I'm trying to work on this in a much more concerted way, which was really how do you dovetail conservation and uh, into city planning processes and into the ima rather larger imagination of uh, the the way we uh, live and work in our cities. So local area planning becomes a very important role in that. And uh, what I've been able to do is uh, with uh, um, help of various collaborators, partners and agencies is to identify um, at least a, a, a several sets of important uh, heritage precincts within uh, North Calcutta's uh, Chitpur Road, which is the oldest street of Calcutta, which predates the, the British period. And it's, as you can see here, a road that runs north to south uh, and is about four and a half kilometers long with historic neighborhoods, historic uh, trades and uh, traditional pra uh, craft practices and trade practices, uh, along with uh, residential quarters, markets, uh, precincts and religious precincts on both sides of the street. But sadly, Calcutta has no uh, provision to notify and list historic neighborhoods and therefore we see that again heritage is lost daily while you have on the left what you see the kind of neighborhoods uh, the, the scale uh, the, the quaint alleys and a kind of life that they uh, in, that inherently have, which is still very much active. On the other hand, you also see this rampant change and this loss that is taking place. But so what do you do about it where this was a project where there's actually there's no client and there's no funding. So, uh, so you have to sort of speculate on what can be done and uh, draw out potential partners and potential uh, like-minded aligned uh, organizations that can help you take the work forward to a firstly document these undocumented neighborhoods and then sort of build a case for uh, and, and create a pressure group that allows you to uh, do something concrete and tangible about this so the first uh, pilot sort of workshop i did was with this organization in 2018 uh, called hamdasti in kolkata supported by west bengal tourism which was a small uh, a small workshop as a pilot project to document one one small stretch of uh, Chitpur. Chitpur Road. But what that led to was uh, a lot of media support and a lot of uh, community engagement. And when we did this small exhibition as part of the festival, uh, the, the idea was to, you know, not do a glamorous exhibition in a gallery, but do, do it in one of the buildings where the, the, you engage with the local uh, neighborhood um, residents and, and visitors. And you, you embed an imagination about the neighborhood in, in their own minds. And what that then led 
led to and a more scaled up and sustained engagement for the last three years has been this collaboration, uh, with, which we call the Indo-French workshop with uh, the the, the uh, school. And so in Paris, uh, La Villette with uh, Bharti Vidya Peet in Navi Mumbai and the College of Architecture in Trivandrum, where we did a concerted documentation exercise of uh, several uh, streets, neighborhoods and precincts uh, starting in 2020. And then the pandemic hit, but we were able to do a second edition of this with newer partners uh, in 2020 as well. And what that yields is uh, a, a set of very comprehensive and detailed uh, student led um, a documentation of these neighborhoods but also understanding that they're not just buildings and you know streetscapes and facades so it's not just the morphology but the life within them as well the communities that live in them the migrants that have come to this area everybody who has a stake in the place and again we got a lot of media support uh, to to really put out our ideas our documentation our uh, uh, the, the student proposals uh, in the public domain and which, which was rare because mainstream newspapers uh, sort of don't like to publish architectural drawings etc because like nobody understands them according to them so it was also you know a, a great step forward in generating this conversation around the city which then led to uh, a more uh, a more concerted effort to create pressure to create pre uh, pressure groups uh, through so organizations that I'm uh, associated with, such as ICOMOS India and other NGOs in Calcutta to really in a holistic way, uh, raise pressure and uh, swap a pressure. And all of this naturally then leads to, you know, where as, as has already been established, research and education play a very important role in the way I work or a way I think about um, actually working in, uh, on actual sites and through various books that I have either authored or um, have been part of as uh, as the core team. Uh, so these are some of the salient uh, ones that have also helped in spreading the awareness, spreading the uh, uh, reaching out to communities and uh, positioning, understanding of your culture and communities in a different way. Of course, uh, uh, along with a, a range of lectures, talks and masterclasses, which I have been very fortunate to have been invited as well for each of these kind of engagements. But one uh, one uh, specific one that I'd like to talk about here uh, in gr some greater depth is this book that uh, we did in 2019 uh, with uh, George Michel, who is, of course, an authority in South Asia um, architecture of the South Asia and specifically um, India and with George we were kind of re-looking at uh, the Hoysala legacy looking at three specific places Belur and Halibid are extremely well known they also are part of the uh, India's tentative list as the sacred ensembles to um, uh, of the Hoysalas in the UNESCO tentative list but we were sort of also looking at the temple which is Somnath Pura and these are a range of photographs from uh, the book uh, beautifully shot and uh, commissioned uh, we were looking at this third temple which sort of marked the uh, the complete growth curve and trajectory of architectural development of the Hoysalas which actually started at Belur so Belur was really the genesis and evolution of seeding that style and the it matured in Ho in Halibid and then what we see in Somnathpura was really the fag end of uh, the, the Hoysala uh, empire. But we see that all of this these styles come together to get a really small jewel of a temple. And this book sort of encapsulates all of that through uh, these field trips that I did. And again, it was a huge education for me to uh, travel with George uh, for this, who at his age, with his energy levels, really Really, you know, motivates and inspires you to also uh, do something um, constructive and uh, contributing. And through the sort of conversations we had at site, the learnings, you almost, you know, you went back to being a student again in the process of writing a book. And uh, these were things that uh, I worked on at site with him. And it, it felt like going on one of those uh, as RSPs when you're in college. But in the process, we, we, we were putting 
together an approach to look at the different way of looking at these temples and not just from the lens of its art history as has been normally said so again there were a range of talks and uh, awareness around the book uh, as as book talks that were held and this was the same time that intac in bangalore was working on a dossier to uh, uh, renominate uh, the uh, the hoysala uh, legacies into uh, unesco and uh, uh, i think some of our conservations and i met that team and about 2 years later in 2021 uh, it was announced that somnath pura which was not uh, originally a part of that ensemble uh, only belur and halebid were had been added and had been included as another serial nomination uh, to the world heritage uh, existing world heritage nomination and which earlier this year secured its um, its um, unesco status so in a way uh, i think the book was able to establish the importance of somnath pura uh, as a valuable addition and that sort of spiraled into uh, this broader imagination of the hoysala legacy across um as i move on to now looking at uh, some of the uh, the community engagements that i've had and this for me is very very important because uh, i'm working with i'm tr constantly trying to look at plurality and multiculturalism which in today's india is completely uh, threatened and you know in many places being shredded and how do we look at ethnic minorities ethnic heritage um who who that are communities that are sort of losing their voice and were once sort of thriving um in a place so uh, through this project which was was incidentally my first urban conservation uh, program after my i came back from my masters was the old uh, chinatown in trader bazaar in kolkata uh, the, the this issue of visibilizing ethnic heritage because it became very very important because as part of my research through an intact led a uh, project for which i was the principal consultant called the char project i realized that it's not only about architectural conservation here it is about instilling community pride because the chinese had felt like they have become invisible that they don't have a voice or a presence left in the city anymore they're not valued so how do you first sort of reinstill that pride and this is a short clip which i hope is So from thirty thousand to when I started working here, the community had been reduced to about three thousand. So that's about to ten percent of what they originally were. And there were several reasons for why such a uh, ma uh, marginalization had happened. Why they had moved out. Uh, while some of their assets kind of remain in the neighborhood uh, the most important being the aftermath of the 1962 indo china war which saw them being picked up and sent to det detention camps in rajasthan and being kept there for four years after even the war was over and that has led to a complete sort of disconnection and alienation of a very very thriving community in india um at the behest of and, and the scars of these then uh, led to a massive exodus and a complete change in uh, the neighborhood and the quality of life in that uh, neighborhood so as you can see from these are some of the pictures from 2014 the insensitive development and change that has taken place in the uh, urban fabric uh, primarily as a resultant of the disintegration of social fabric but the chinese temples which are all grade 1 monuments uh, they have a, a thriving life when every every year they come back for chinese new year to celebrate in kolkata and they feel that connection to the city as calcuttans and they're largely sixth seventh generation born in india uh, indian chinese community that we are talking about so again this was a uh, a collaborative workshop that i did this was again i was i was still in sept at uh, that time but working as a, a consultant to the char project and with an uh, international collaborative workshop with the arhus uh, uh, school in denmark we were able to do an intensive three week workshop here with the community being an equal stakeholder and this is really the kind of map they had and they were working with uh, and and it's really not a map uh they just some red colored patches so they didn't really know even what is the boundary of their own neighborhood where does it start where does it stop what all assets do they
they even have left and i, I think one of the uh, great outcomes that came out of this the char project documentation workshop as part of the summer school uh, was uh, to to really define and create the first sort of documentation and uh, and giving them a sort of visibility by documenting each of the temples speaking to each of the heads of each of these clubs and presidents of the temples and letting the community feel that they have a stake in in the project and not just you know an external agency but also suggesting sensitive and con contextual improvements which respond to the uh, streetscape scale and character and not just transplanting uh, foreign images of what a chinatown should look like in london or in los angeles or anywhere else in the world but respecting the vernacular architecture of the calcutta neighborhoods and the scale in which they uh, their everyday lives live so over the next 3 uh, years we were through sort of um, art interventions cultural interventions festivals we were able to first have revised the community which becomes imperative for conservation you, you know nobody you, you cannot find any success with just conserving one building you need to enthuse the community get them on board and feel get them to feel proud about what they have and then they themselves by 2017 were organizing their their own sort of festivals they had moved the, uh, and engaging with the city they were reclaiming their own city in large numbers through these kind of cultural events uh, that we participated in and that slowly uh, started uh, uh also having an impact on the buildings and the quality of the neighborhood where over the next 2 years uh, there there were small improvements made in the streets through small adaptive reuse uh it, examples through family led uh Uh, businesses to open a new restaurant in a through adaptive reuse etc in their neighborhood so it's been a sort of long struggle which has engaged uh, many students uh, students have done master thesis is on them or or their undergrad thesis on them on chinatown and chinatown was a place that nobody knew of and people also did not of calcutta didn't really either go there or uh, knew know anything about them other than enjoying chinese food in the city so um, and and that that long sort of stretch has now led to in this year to an excellent nomination that was submitted by a young architect called Shomi Pine uh secured a sort of uh, uh put Chinatown on to the 2022 world monuments watch uh establishing its global significance but also bringing spotlight to the fact that it is endangered the fact that if we don't do anything about it now uh we are probably going to lose what remains of india's only um thriving chinatown today and therefore through these efforts you know you cannot escape the realm of uh, engagement and participation which is uh, really how you as towards how do you give the baton to the community itself to people itself and therefore i look at i reemphasize that looking at my practice as a as catalyst as a facilitator that in, allows these sort of conversations and these uh, sort of uh, initiatives and gives a platform to them and then other people can carry it through you know i don't need to see it through for many many years you you create that sort of base where uh, you mobilize and you empower empower community these and other professionals who over time will take over the work will be civil society advocates will be the movement sustainers beyond a period of time and act as agents of change by first informing themselves so these again have been multiple and different kinds of engagements in different landscapes of bengal this is from the industrial uh, landscape of the asansol ranuganj coal belt where there was a small project that was doing with the university of Ed Ed Edinburgh uh, for the industrial heritage uh, people's participation and symposiums become a very important way of uh, displaying and exhibiting this work and uh, sort of reseeding these conversations about the city to people who have sort of forgotten about certain areas of your your city itself and then of course engaging directly with different kinds of stakeholders on the street in different non traditional spaces which are non gallery spaces and how do you really take the work to them and engage with uh, with the average citizen of uh, of a place and not the already enlightened or the already converted uh, uh, ones 
and because of that advocacy and activism naturally becomes an important uh, tool uh, to do this because uh, i i i regularly write uh, on issues that are important to me uh, while also voicing my uh, opinion and concerns uh, when either buildings are pulled down or a major sort of disaster happens um, due due to which uh, either governments or agencies or somebody is you know uh, tipping the scale in some other direction and then the final um, the final pivot that i'm going to be talking about is how would i then integrate uh, and and this is something that i've been doing in the last 3 uh, or 4 years more consciously bring in uh, a design uh, into uh, into my work through uh, the space of museums exhibitions and cultural heritage and these are two projects that really were the seed of uh, my interest where uh, the one on the left is was done uh, when i was a curatorial uh, fellow during an internship in my masters program um, at the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt in New York uh, it was an exhibition called Pat's Passion for the Ex- uh, Exotic which looked at uh, Lockwood De Forest uh, who was a 19th century um, artist painter interior designer in the US who brought in this east indian sort of sensibility and he in fact uh, had a workshop in amdabad with the hathi singh family and which is why you can see all of this traditional amdavadi uh, woodwork uh, in and this was in this uh, cooper hewitt itself one of the rooms and this mansion earlier belonged to the andrew carnegie family the sort of steel and railroad baron uh, in new york city and uh, i i had the good fortune of working on this exhibition with the curator only because i had worked on a book called the history of interior design um in india um which was looking at amdavad at, at, at my time um, in set so i kind of dovetailed into this project as a curatorial fellow and that sort of sowed the seed and an interest for me uh, to pursue a cultural heritage through uh, museums and exhibition design and the second was a uh, four years later, Later, and the reason I moved to Mumbai was uh, the exhibition curated by Rahul Mehrotra, uh, Ranjit Hoskote, and Kaiwan Mehta called "The State of Architecture" uh, at the NGMA in Mumbai, for which I was the project manager. And these two sort of, you know, were very different. One you can see is very, very contemporary. The other was looking at um, a, a more historical kind of an exhibition. The, it really um, sprung this uh, direction and a sort of new direction for me to also. to explore as part of my uh, practice through a uh, design and some of some of the exhibitions that i've been part of for the last uh, since 2018 on my own uh, this was a very important one which is called bengal's durga it was an effort by the british council which was celebrating 70 years in india and the west Beng- uh, west bengal tourism to sort of showcase bengal's durga puja to an international audience and which would funnel and give impetus to international tourism coming into uh, bengal but sadly then the pandemic and all that hit but uh, but it really seeded a process again a ripple effect where uh, we did an uh, exhibition which was right on the south bank on uh, the thames as an open uh, on the promenade which was again not in a gallery so that you know passer by people who sit in the park sit on the bench people people who park the uh, pass by on their way to work etc are able to engage with this raise their curiosity and uh, sort of develop a conversation around what is bengal's durga puja and how do we sort of partake in that and this was again uh, for, uh, it ran for a month as part of the totally thames uh, festival where then we had uh, and and while this was happening in london the same year uh, at the durga puja in calcutta this was the opening uh, in london etc and while this was happening the same year in um, in kolkata which was thronging with uh, with people visitors both national and international during durga puja uh, we could see the same sort of the 
the video and this initiative by the West Bengal government uh, also playing in some of the pandals uh, in some of the pandals themselves to raise this sort of uh, uh, sta heightened status and awareness about Bengal Durga Puja not only being a festival but actually being a cultural economy that employs number of people. It's a great contributor uh, and a great sustainer of traditional crafts, traditional processes, while bringing in new imagination and new design to uh, as an urban installation for uh, 10 days and all of these processes then eventually led to um, in the last year uh, a, a nomination dossier was submitted uh, by the state party to uh, to secure uh, Durga Pujo's entry and inscription to the UNA uh, UNESCO list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity, which was again um, a very big um, a sort of culmination to all these efforts that diverse actors have put in to, uh, to give the festival the status that it rightly uh, deserves. And uh, uh, finally, I'll just conclude with two other small projects that I've recently done uh, in, in Mumbai. This is within, this is for the Indian Navy inside the Naval Dockyard Precinct, which is really a 285 year old precinct, probably one of the earliest. They consider it the zero point of Bombay from where Bombay really started as a city. And this was a heritage hall, uh, a sort of old sailing loft. Uh, for the yard which existed since 1895 but had been restored and renovated in 2006 and this is where we were sort of redesigning uh, the exhibition which talks about the 285 year old legacy of the naval dockyard when it started out from a fledgling marine yard of the British East India Company to now being one of the most cutting edge and technologically advanced refit and repair uh, institutions for uh, the Indian Navy and within this um, heritage building, we were able to sort of uh, talk about this trajectory of time where I was the um, curator and the concept uh, uh, designer and it was executed by a team uh, from their end through both looking at the historic sail ships that the yard made to the modern uh, and cutting edge submarines and warships that the yard continues to uh, maintain and refit uh, today. So this was a really interesting uh, learning experience as well for me to, to, to work with the defense organization and then sort of instill this sense of value towards their own cultural heritage for their own sort of naval uh, community and uh, staff and family and every yard worker who works uh, within this precinct. And, uh, and another project where again, which again, then this is uh, finished just a few months ago, which looks at where I worked with the, 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 the leaders and volunteers from uh, the Daudi Bohra community in uh, Mumbai to put up an um, inaugural exhibition for a rosa that was being built and dedicated to the 53rd uh, Sayyidna Kutkuddin. Uh, and again, here, uh, through a very simple exhibition, the idea was to talk about the vision the vision of the Rosa and where, uh, its architectural sort of influences and inspirations, taking inspiration from traditional Yemeni and Fatimid um, elements and how that blends with Indian design, with technology and innovation and really working with the community again. So as you can see, community con uh, and different kinds of communities uh, continue to play a very important role in what I engage in and to really work with the community to put up an exhibition for the inauguration of the Rosa, uh, which was meaningful and of value to them. So just as a concluding slide, again, this is really how the, my work sort of comes together and blends and is in one, each is synergy in synergy with uh, the other, because the whole idea is to situate yourself as a catalyst that valorizes these forgotten places, the untold stories and this diversity of India. And to do that, I'm immensely, immensely, of course, as a practice, thankful to all the various uh, collaborators, partners, patrons, students uh, because they have all had a very important stake in sort of achieving and going uh, and making the small impacts that uh, we have managed to make uh, so far. Thank you. Thank you, Kamalika. Thank, Thank you. you for that wonderful presentation. And it was really nice to see the range of activities that you have been 
involved in and how each activity in that sense is not an isolated sort of a cocoon but also supports the other things that are happening but what is actually common thing in all of this is the title that you have chosen uh, practice as catalyst where you are not sort of trying to bring the change at you know sort of with one action but as a kind of a sustained effort over a period of time by facilitating certain processes okay uh, within the community by working with the community with various stakeholders and over a period of time transforming those uh, historical urban context into more sustained sort of uh, conservation projects so that is something that one can see continuously a thread that is going through even when you are sort of dealing with the communities and the chinatown project that you shared the idea here is not sort of come up with a big project but to come up with a series of actions at various scales to and then sort of step back and let the community take over so uh, i think that don't you think that this is sort of the most ideal way of going around with uh, when we're talking about conservation uh, uh, and particularly in the context of india not just india but southeast asia where most of these dense urban contexts are actually living uh, contexts and getting densified you know the densities are increasing day by day so uh, uh, don't you think that this is sort of the most ideal way of going about the uh, conservation when we talk about the historic urban contexts yes i mean ideal or not i don't know because every context has its own sort of challenges and um, approaches but mm-hmm. yes i mean uh, my learning has been that if this is the most sort of meaningful and gentle way to work in a, a historic context while giving always the importance to uh, the stakeholder and the client and you know you and, and the community and so you and this is something that you know our schools of design and architecture don't teach us they teach us that you are at the center you know your your ego your stamp yeah. your role on uh, in a project so there's also a lot of unlearning i have had uh, to do in the process that how do i look at myself as a facilitator and then uh, you know the work that we achieve is sort of collectively achieved and uh, and then people take it forward it's not for me to always be there at the forefront and have to do something because that is exhausting and it takes time many of these projects run a decade there are big successful successes big failures as well uh, and and you have to sort of hand over the baton uh, for for it to have a natural life of its own yeah yeah so the the idea is that then when you sort of step back you know it should be able to sustain in a in a as a much better society not just as a, as a physical object of a, an architectural uh, or let's say an urban context or a streetscape but also as as a, a, a as a much holistic society which also is able to generate uh, income or you know so make sure that it is able to sustain so uh, but I, um, the problem itself i know the way you started but the thing is that you call it everyday heritage and that's a wonderful term for the these areas which are sort of neglected which we don't know and even in amtabad going around old city you come across this quite often so don't you think that the currently the way we actually recognize the heritage is much more inclined towards you know what is sort of iconic heritage that we see Uh, so yeah if i talk about the amtabad a few you know big sort of uh, places which generally the tourists visit but these so uh, 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 is there a problem at the grassroots starting level yeah. itself when the government you know the agencies need to come forward and say that okay this is also heritage and we need to do something about Yeah. No that's very true because the problem lies at the root the problem lies that we are continuing to 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 i to identify list uh heritage as grade 1 grade 2 um uh, as a sort of baggage we carry or a methodology that we have inherited 
adopted from our colonial past and that is the way we continue to look at our historic cities many of them which are traditional historic cities they predate uh, the, the british and they predate the way uh, these systems you know have uh, evolved so we don't have a rational or a scientific way to look at our vast sort of inheritance which is why the easier way seems to be to you know do a listing of 500 buildings in a city or 800 buildings in a city which are important because yes i mean realistically speaking it is not possible to conserve everything and just because something is old does not necessarily mean that it merits conservation so it's you also have to understand where do you let go and where do you draw the line and what is it that you can afford to let go of and what is it that you can't but in the process of letting go if we let go of our neighborhoods you know then we will only be left with uh, the, these sort of new age condominiums and enclaves uh, which are there and if we are only focused on monuments and you know the important grade one buildings then the rest of the city is going to go so definitely municipalities heritage bodies ngos you know firstly we need to reinvent our toolkit for understanding what is of significance and significance largely in even today is derived by architectural quality itself that firstly it has to be a beautiful building only then it merits conservation neighborhoods are not like that neighborhoods are collective ensembles where every building contributes to the overall character of that area and then we are able to embed that into our uh, into the imagination of the planning process uh, we are only going to be left with beautiful cherry picked buildings around the city yeah and it also needs a different kind of approach to conservation you know the as as you have been demonstrating throughout your lecture that it, it needs a kind of a sustained effort along you know maybe over a course of 5 years 10 years you know and then you know, and not just architects or designers but multiple stakeholders could sort of need to come in people who can engage with the local community uh, people who could you know make them people aware of you know that okay what they have has a certain value it may not have value in terms of money but it does definitely has a certain value in terms of architectural heritage but that's where also the conflict of sort of comes in that when we look at many of these historical urban areas uh there are kind of memories of the cities that you know the cities have preserved over a period of time and they they tell us about the past uh and we can understand what the city might have been like uh on the other hand the people who are staying there okay they 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 have maybe a, a different kinds of aspirations different they they want to up, upgrade their infrastructure or living standards or whatever it is so how does one sort of deal with this you know how does one balance between the two yeah no that that it that does end up really becoming that deal breaker that sort of striking that midpoint between um aspirations because all said and done you know as uh, and and i think we were taught this throughout school as well uh, that you know all of these old neighborhoods the poles the mohallas gallies kuchas they are beautiful and we romanticize them to no end but at the end of the day we have to look at it from the perspective of its inhabitant and if they don't have access as to good toilets or a proper functional kitchen you know it's it's not going to be a value to them no matter how much you tell them that 300 years back your forefathers came and settled here so there has to be a a way to make them see the value of staying where you're staying without uh, uh, because otherwise they're prepared to move out you know if if they have the economic mobility to move to a a more uh, developed or a swankier part of the city they will but if unless you put in those uh, ways in which you can uh, bombay has done it through redevelopment of some kind uh, which is not always successful uh, but you know if, unless you change some incentives the landlord or the owners etc are not going to get uh, the motivation to plow in any kind of investment to upgrade livability in these neighborhoods you know so one can't blame them for the aspiration we all have aspirations to stay in better places invest in better places but many of them are sort of languishing in derelict neighborhoods only because they can't 
they, they they don't have the mobility to go um, elsewhere and hence the focus has to be on uh on giving them these sort of incentives and making it attractive for not only the community to self initiate because in that way it will be most authentic because sometimes you know you you give the incentives to developers and developers will come in and develop it in a very different way you know which we are also seeing where with where due to due to incentives you have a building which is restored but just behind it there's a 20 story building also coming up in the plot yeah and that's like a unhappy marriage of okay but the heritage also exists but in neighborhoods either uh, without incentives it will lead to gentrification where en masse it will there will be a exodus and other kind of commercial activities will happen which has happened to kalaghoda in mumbai but that works because it's a, a commercial and a recreation area it's not a purely residential area but residential areas get heavily threatened if uh, if there are no sort of systemic uh changes and we can't blame the community for having aspirations at all you know we have to figure out how to balance those aspirations with a value for that and it not just a better quality of life for aspirations but also you talked about the land prices you know there is there is an aspect of uh, of growth or the real estate sort of is always looming over that okay you know in this particular you're in the heart of the city and and that is also sort of you know a kind of where the communities tend to sort of feel inclined towards that okay let's just get out of this place you know and so uh, that is also that in maybe that's a bigger challenge than than sort of the upgrading the lifestyle because we could bring in a good designer and still upgrade and give them a better quality of life to, to a very great extent but how do you counter this sort of argument that okay there is uh, unless and until there is some kind of a government policy which sort of comes in and helps you with that it's next to impossible to sort of you know uh, convince somebody to yeah. to live with it no you're very right because which is also one of the reason that the char project with the chinatown like at many levels it didn't work up because you know we were trying to do both we were trying to do top down and bottom up bottom up is where you work with the community and still the pride etc and top down is when you actually submit a dpr to the government yeah. get them to make infrastructure and amenity upgrades in the in the neighborhood plow in some investment etc etc but beyond the point that didn't really go anywhere because yes i mean this neighborhood sits in the bang in the the middle of commercial real estate surrounded by you know very high uh, commercial real estate all around so um so these are actually the the real challenges and the, and some places we will not make headway unless we the the municipal authority or the city agency and the government intervenes uh, to do that and and we, we we are constantly you know always giving examples of the west in the west cities have managed to do this and the west cities have managed to do that but we are not being able to do any of that but that is because there are all these strict incentives and regulations and policies which very few cities in india they are they, they are met with short successes you know bombay has managed to do some things intermittently over a period of time uh it uh, amdabad has managed to do again a series of small actions between the 90s and the uh, uh, 2000s but these all uh, intact in pondicherry has managed to do some very good work in uh, preserving but these are all you know uh, small examples but it they sustain for a few years and then something else takes over so that is actually a big challenge uh, for urban conservation itself that unless we you know therefore integrated within city planning processes unless you have historic areas that have different rules and regulations through local area planning than other parcels of land in the city and how they are developed right now there's like a one stroke approach Uh, to everything because because there is no uh, there are no heritage zones or heritage precincts which are formally um, uh, applied in at least in the context where i work you know especially i'm speaking in the context of bengal and even in in mumbai we have seen that even notified areas on the heritage precincts on the heritage list uh, by the gap between uh, studying them documenting them and notifying them is so much in 10 years sometimes 15 years sometimes but that, by then the neighborhood has changed so when yeah. the heritage committee goes again to uh, recheck it they say okay 70% of this neighborhood's character has changed so ab to ye heritage nahi hai 
so automatically you know you can now you can develop it because it's not a heritage precinct anymore so uh, a lot of these things work in sort of small uh, pockets or for a short span of time and that is the struggle struggle and that is the challenge yeah so uh, you need work at both as you said work from the bottom up and also the help taking from the government making sure that certain through certain policies or certain laws uh, you know uh, they are taken care of maybe certain incentives are given to the people who are staying there to be there and maintain and those kind of sort of top down approach is also very much needed otherwise in the long term maybe this will not sort of be able to sustain the pressure from the real estate so uh, i would like to come you know this is wonderful work that we have seen in your at different scales the you know curatorial design heritage conservation now uh, you've also been involved with the education right so uh, how do you think uh, the uh, what kind of people we need to train or sort of come out so that more these kind of initiatives are generated and actions are taken so that's a very important question because it's really about you know our education even my undergrad education did not train me to look at uh, uh, historic cities or historic context because the focus largely was on uh, what can you build new and only if you are you know building new and leaving your own mark is it when you are a successful designer or a successful um architect but of course you know uh, we you you do you know you do that one odd adaptive reuse studio you do one that one odd uh, elective in appreciation of heritage or something like that but uh, in in the education of the five year undergraduate education itself uh, of course now in the last few years there has been a conversation around how do you bring in this in a more uh, systematic way but i think it's really important to seed an entire new generation of uh, of designers who are oriented towards working in uh, historic cities in indian cities and not just uh, you know making new buildings which are like copying skyscrapers and other kinds of new programs which will remain of course there will remain and there will be a market for that and a place for that but without compromising on that can we also build parallel uh, competence and awareness and interest and i think that is what i have been trying to do through my academic engagements whether it is through workshops and most of these workshops is, as you have seen are field based workshops so you actually bring the students to a site where they most of them are coming for the first time they have never been to any of these places they have never uh, heard of these places or so many times and through through learning by doing on site through meeting the communities engaging with them you know that something changes in them always i have seen and at, at the end of it you know initially they may be feeling that we don't know you know this is not something that we've done i don't even, we don't even know why we are doing it uh, but but by the time they have finished it and especially when they see this sort of a that it contributes to a meaningful action it's just not a report which is on their libraries or only for their portfolios but it has some meaning meaningful outcome that is having a positive change uh, i have seen many of these students uh, in time either pursue uh, conservation uh, programs as masters or take up conservation oriented topics in their undergraduate or masters thesis so so definitely you know the idea is about again seeding uh, bringing that change in the mind of the student that this is also something worth pursuing in future and that's how you can hope that you will create a new generation of designers and architects who are more interested in and to to work more sensitively in uh, the built environment yeah and also work in a collaborative way by Um, absolutely absolutely talking with talking with the communities with other people who can actually connect them with the communities in different contexts etc uh, i think it was wonderful to uh, see your 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 diverse kind of activities that you have been doing over the last so many years 10 years your work on the heritage conservation work on the communities front and also on the curatorial and the design front and as you rightly said there are a lot of connections Uh, between these and they also sort of come up various ways in the kind of workshops in the education field and the research that you do so it's a kind of a holistic approach to uh, 
it's not just a conservation as an architectural or a designer specific activity but uh, there is definitely a role as a designer that you bring in when you go as as a as an urban conservationist but that's not it that's just one part of it there are a whole lot of other layers that come and make the project complete so i think that is a wonderful wonderful takeaway from from your presentation and this discussion uh, kamalika thank you so much uh, for giving us your time it was wonderful to see your work and also to interact with you thank you so much ayaz thank you for having me thank you and i would like to conclude here by thanking the people who joined with us on various social media platforms thank you for joining with us thank you